Okay, our, um, the um, next session is going to last for a 20-minute uh, talk, and afterwards we'll have a five-minute question and answer. Josh, I'll, 15 minutes into it, I'll give you the, uh, the uh, sign. Uh, with that uh, said, our final speaker of this session, Josh uh, Vermillion, is uh, speaking. The uh, topic is uh, designer as toolmaker, crafting the digital information between designers, makers, and machines. Josh? Thanks, John. Um, I apologize. I'm just going to read my abstract off of the booklet. It seemed easier that way than bringing it up here. But uh, just to sort of briefly describe what I mean uh, by the title, designer as toolmaker. Um, and of course, uh, uh, we all use tools um, for everyday things. And uh, especially for designs, tools extend our ability to complete tasks, right? And um, what I want to talk today is, is about not necessarily um, hand tools or drawing tools or even software tools just right out of the box and plugged in. But what I want to talk about is uh, uh, self-made tools, scripting, uh, sort of designing with a parametric capacity um, where we begin to look at what we need to do and actually design tools to help us accomplish that. So I'm just going to, to quickly buzz through the abstract while flipping through some slides. I apologize, just like Chris, I have, it seems to be front loaded with text and then I get to graphics and I'll probably end up by the end having to, to blow through those very quickly uh, to, to meet 20 minutes, but um, I'll start. I start off with a quote by Bernard Cash, a French architect, who says, digital technologies really put at stake the architecture of information lying behind the building and this architecture with digits also has to be designed. So in other words, he's not talking about um, making images. He's not talking about um, um, just coming up with a sort of a, a priori sort of genius moment. He's talking about this sort of um, complicated and iterative process of going under the hood and actually uh, um, extending our ability to do things with our own tools. Um, machinic systems, parametric models, um, things that are, allow us to capture our design intention through an explicit recording, a sort of step-by-step -step procedural method um, that can be executed and re-executed right, over and over again um, in order to uh, collect, organize, integrate, and disseminate uh, the information necessary to um, realize a project, to communicate not only with, uh, among ourselves, but also, uh, as I say, designers, but also with those who make, right, makers. And that also includes having direct dialogue with machines that make things as well. And, uh, might be talking a bit too abstractly. I hope uh, the presentation as we go through sort of clears things up. And then I look forward to your, your feedback. Um, anyway, I, I'm using, I purposely use the, the sort of terms and language that I did in the abstract where I talk about performance criteria of fitness or fit so, uh, uh, solution, you know, fitness criteria, um, propagation, right, uh, so on and so forth, parameters, information, um, because I think that's really uh, the heart of all of this is how do we as designers begin to utilize information in a much more seamless way that begins to inform design. Um, of course, uh, <laughs> if we uh, look at uh, like a metalsmith, right? Metalsmith takes years to train. Uh, traditionally, it was an apprentice um, that learns uh, by doing, making and thinking by doing, right? And there's all sorts of, of uh, learning curves to this. There's different sort of tools. Each tool has a purpose. Each, uh, even, even something as simple as knowing how to use a hammer, hold a hammer, and swing a hammer. So you can actually swing it 10,000 times in an hour and uh, still use your arm afterwards, right, et cetera, et cetera. There's a sort of hand-eye coordination, right? There's practice, there's experience, there's a craft behind it, right? It's the sort of second part of architect, technique, sort of knowledge of making. I'm not going to 
try to draw a parallel with that. And uh, I should pre premise this before I get into the, the actual projects themselves. And, um, I, this isn't one particular paper that was presented. What I noticed is that a lot of our projects, a lot of our publications and everything sort of had a common trajectory running through it and then involved this idea of scripting and parametrics and, and sort of tool making. Okay. So I want to start off with this quote by Marshall McLuhan. You've probably heard this a million times. You've probably seen all of his crazy zany videos. If you haven't, so you can check them out in the library. We shape our tools and our tools in turn shape us. Right? So we've shaped computers, right? And I guess what I'm asking is how do we really utilize computers? Computation, right, as a, a design tool. And um, certainly, I'll, I'll, I'll show some examples. There are lots of hints in the past, deeply rooted in our past, the analog examples of a sort of, you might say, computationally based um, or uh, 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 algorithmically based approach to, to design and making. Right? I couldn't help but draw the comparison between the sort of turn of the last century and the turn of this century and, and the sort of, uh, you know, the Frank Lloyd Wrights of the world, the, the Bauhaus folks of the world, uh, um, talking about the, the sort of excitement of, of engaging the machine, designers engaging the production processes once again, right? The, the Bauhaus believes the machine to be our modern medium of design and seeks to come to terms with it. So I, I uh, throw that in as a sort of caveat that we have to be very careful um, that our visions, like Walter Gropius's vision, um, doesn't uh, fall to the wayside of, of uh, mass production and, and economies of scale and, and bottom lines, and that we actually, um, as designers, can, can begin to affect change. Although we're arriving late to the game in terms of the sort of new standards of production. Key to this is that we're constantly integrating technology and that we actually has to have to, unlike the traditional 20th century models, actually begin um, lengthy, early, and very often these sort of uh, conversations um, with those who make things, right? It almost goes contrary uh, to the sort of uh, 20th century model of how architects or designers interact with those who make things downstream, right? And those who assemble them on site. Right? So, um, but just to talk a little bit about uh, another visionary, Nicholas Negroponte, of course, at I'm, I'm MIT and founded the, the uh, before he founded the Media Lab, he actually wrote this book called Architecture Machine, in which he talks about the powers of computation as something that, that could, uh, Let's see. Tickle the architect's imagination, presenting alternatives that wouldn't even be possible to be visualized by the human designer. And I refer to a, a, a passage from uh, Shop Architects in Manhattan from their uh, uh, AD issue uh, called Versioning, when they talk about this sort of process product. So what I'm talking about here is the, uh, the creation of tools and systems that are in themselves actually um, uh, take a step up in precedence along with their, uh, with the actual output, right? So we're talking about very much as a part of a, um, a sort of process-based notion, uh, the paradigm shift from sort of making a form um, to finding form. In other words, the, the power relies in the sort of system that can help us uh, organize information and create output. The output is almost secondary because the output isn't static, right? The output is variable. Depending on what we plug in, we get different results. Output. And I did actually mention the word craft in my uh, uh, title. And I'm just going to touch on that. It's a can of worms I, I can't, I don't have 20 minutes to discuss. Um, but I, I have some quotes here regarding craft. And, and essentially, when, when I talk about craft, I'm referring to a sort of very careful um, dialogue with tools and making and thinking, and that there's a synthesis between those. And I talk about a feedback loop, whereas um, uh, related to practice, right, um, and rigor, like we, we make stuff in order to learn so that we make something else even better. And that this is also not necessarily dependent or interdependent on hand tools or uh, 
digital tools, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. I'm just going to uh, go right on to the project. Um, so I'm, I'm going to show just a, a quick selection of um, projects over the last year from uh, Institute for Digital Fabrication. Uh, I, I accept, I, I'm not going to like claim authorship or ownership of any of these projects. Um, sometimes I was directly involved with their success or, or, or whatever. Sometimes I was involved only on the periphery. I come in with a workshop and build up someone's skill sets or enhance it in some way or helping to administer the project from afar. But um, anyway, I, uh, this is uh, parametric folding. It's from a seminar last spring. Um, a team of three students worked with an aluminum fabricator here in Muncie called Midwest Metals. Um, but we quickly taught them how to, to script. And one of the, the objectives of the um, course uh, was the sort of creation of ornament or pattern, looking at pattern as a sort of ornament that could be described. Um, and so uh, the reason I'm showing this is that they, what they did is they basically took a pattern, a recipe, an algorithm, and they actually wrote a script so they could execute it and re-execute it with different uh, uh, inputs, parameters, um, variables. And so what you see here is on the left-hand side, if you can see my cursor. Uh oh. This is their first, the, the, the sort of first iteration of this, these sort of panels that were going to be laser cut, right? So you can see it was a pretty intricate panel. Um, there was a pretty, uh, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, there was a pretty, uh, uh, ah, there we go. It's just slow and responding. Anyway, they took this panel to, um, to the fabricator, right? So they started that dialogue with the people who would actually make this, right? We had a big laser cutter. This thing's ridiculously large and cuts through plate steel and aluminum and things like that, right? And uh, immediately red flags were raised. The reason being is uh, they had a limited budget. They had a limited amount of time. Um, and they realized that the... Uh, the, the expense wasn't related to any particular shape or number of shapes. What it was related to, uh, the, the expense would begin to balloon um, every time the laser cutter had to stop, move to a different place, and begin another piercing operation. That had three seconds um, to the time. Each time he had to start a new piercing operation. So they quickly did the math just by looking with an Excel spreadsheet of how many holes they had, how many different shapes they had, uh, multiplying that by three seconds and realized that the man hours and labor costs were, were way too high. Okay. And so you can see their, their clumsy attempt to optimize that a little too far over on the other extreme and so on and so forth. Until they, so in other words, scripting allowed them to um, engage um, and revise um, based on uh, uh, sort of optimizing for economy at the same time for spatial or, or uh, effect. Hopefully this works. I'm just going to restart it. I didn't have this problem on my machine. Let's go to my menu here. As I quickly run out of time here with my presentation not working. But um, yeah, I should have just plugged in my own computer. Anyway, I'll just talk about what's on the menu. You get one thumbnail for each each project, I guess. Um, wow, I completely lost my train of thought. probably just needs to be started. But um, at any rate, let me skip to, uh, if I can get this to work, to the meat of this. And uh, hopefully we can just move on. Yeah, I should have just plugged in my laptop. 
Anyway, you can see a sort of uh, genealogy of projects as we begin to scale up here and there. So I'll just remove this little error window. Okay. Uh, scaling up again, we've worked with uh, metal fabricators on smaller projects. The volume just went up too. That's annoying. Um, aluminum projects, we've worked with uh, fabricators of all sorts all around the state. Um, but essentially, uh, all of these projects dealt with um, a sort of very early conversation with those who make, and uh, that occurred often throughout the design process. Um, ah, here we go. Okay. <laughs> At last, I have a presentation. Okay. So let's talk about this for just a second, and maybe I'll, I'll pray like I can get two or three more slides out of this, since I, it's like 80 slides. Time well spent on my part, I guess. Let me just skip here. The MMFX exhibition. Uh, some of you have probably seen the uh, latest and greatest, the, the completed thing for the first time with this presentation. Um, here's an example where we, uh, uh, the students, engaged a number of industry partners working with a different number of different materials. The whole um, purpose of the exhibition was to show off work. Um, international work as well as very local, like statewide work and, and some of the things that we're capable of doing in, in Indiana. Um, and I want to show you this diagram because this is dealing directly uh, at the level of talking to a machine. This diagram does nothing, says nothing about like the sort of spatial quality of anything. It does nothing to do at all with uh, the materiality of something, right? It's quite simply the vector paths for a CNC mill to follow, right? To, okay. And that's the, extra five minutes. I appreciate that, thank you. Yeah. This is the exact same information, just encoded line by line. Actually, it's shortened, it's not all of it, right? The actual step-by-step -step instructions for a machine to follow. So you can see that it, there's a bunch of instructions we give it, we tell it what kind of tools to do, how fast it should move, um, where to go in X, Y, Z coordinates, uh, how fast to spin the bit, et cetera, et cetera, right? Hey, and then Adam. Here's a video. Yeah, 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 okay. Hey. So the, the students are goofy. It's late at night. And here's this thing working, right? So you can see that not only uh, we're talking about communication at different levels. We're not talking about plan section and elevation, right? That we hand off to somebody and say, please make this for us. We're talking oh, about very specific instructions to you know, people who make them. In this case, we were working in, uh, at a place that uh, does uh, classic vacuum for on campus. They very kindly allowed us to set up a machine there. Um, you can see this thing moving move very fast. It's really robust, et etc. Et You'll see here in a moment, the script will tell us to pick up a different tool, and then it'll, it'll go up and suck up and start spinning again. Oh, here we go. Yeah, OK, here's the first thing. I'll spend the extra 10 seconds to let you guys watch it. Right. So you can see that from those instructions we get this, and this is basically just a design detail that the students came up with on how to connect two linear pieces of wood together in order to create a pretty large uh, rib armature system, right? So you can see that it's just a simple dovetail running in, in sort of counterintuitive direction so they can slide together. Very nice and they did lots of tests and studies just to make sure that the tolerances were just right. And of course we also used the mill and gave it instructions on how to carve stuff in three dimensions. We used that to make a formwork to start saying uh, back and forth in class. I don't know if you guys have ever seen the back and forth in class. Okay, so you'll see the formwork that we build, sculpt it and then uh, sand it, and then suddenly the vacuum sucks down. Tape, things ready to be trimmed. <laughs> of course, at the same time we're doing this, we were doing everything by ourselves over there. So we were installing a dust collection system and at the same time on site uh, installing things. So here are some of the finished products. This is at IMA in the, the digital ex exhibition room, as you, just as you go up into the galleries. 
pretty amazing. Everybody's pretty happy about this. Indiana Limestone, we worked with them. We gave them a digital model of these pieces, and then they, they CNC milled those for us, and we met back up at IMA with this, with this little gargoyle dude that we displayed for them. Okay. Uh, to shift scales completely, like interior fit out and exhibit design to something very small, something that actually had to fit over somebody's face, protective face gear. Um, for uh, baseball infielders, sort of ranging from age of six to ten years old. And so it seemed to be the perfect project to take our ten-year-old DFAB club members from Burris Academy and plug them in as not only the audience, the intended audience for a product like this, but also somebody who, uh, 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 children who wanted to participate in um, making and, and learning about using laser cutters and, and drawing and, and modeling and things like that. Um, so, and this was actually just a local entrepreneur's idea that we were working uh, with uh, to help them out um, with some design and, and fabrication studies. Parametric design, this is what we use. Parametric design, you don't actually like design a shape, right? Like what you're doing is you're uh, designing a sort of uh, system of, of uh, associations, right? So everything that was pre previously static is now sort of dynamic. I, uh, let me just show you an example here. Of course, we had to like figure out how to measure people's heads because this is supposed to fit very precisely to somebody's face, right? And um, as much as I really wanted to take a CAT or CT scan of somebody's head, like we couldn't figure out how to work that out, and it was too little, too invasive. And uh, anyway, so um, I'll talk about that just in, in a minute more. Okay, so here are the 12 easy steps on how to make one of these masks. You define in 2D a projection, a, a profile of the nose, of the sort of center of the, the head, and then of the outline of the head. You project those in three-dimensional space. You use that to, to uh, uh, loft the surface. Then you define the sort of uh, uh, shape of the mask to be projected onto the surface. Right? You mirror it, you project it, you trim, and then you offset into a solid. Right. And then what you basically have are a bunch of uh, parameters and slide bars that you can begin to adjust. So in other words, I didn't model uh, a, sh uh, uh, a static shape. What we did is we thought about the sort of recipe for how to make a mask. And now we can begin to really sort of uh, tweak and, and uh, change things around. Let me just uh, back up here. OK. All kinds of glitches today. Okay, so you can see now as I begin to adjust, well, maybe you can see. That by adjusting some of these slide bars up on the left-hand side, that the whole thing, whole mass begins to change shape. It's running really slow. Okay, so I wanted to also just like take a, one of those handheld laser scanners and scan somebody's face in. Proved impossible because nobody could stay still enough. Um, so what we ended up doing is just taking photographs with a sort of backdrop behind where we could plot out a grid inch by inch and sort of plot these points out. Uh, we sort of traced around the folks' heads. So here's one of our 10-year-old Burris DFAB club members, right? And then here's Jared, who's slightly older than 10 years old. Um, looks kind of like Frodo Baggins. Okay. And we did, and so we let them, we let the 10-year-olds design their own masks. And then we found this really crude uh, vacuum form somewhere and, and uh, we, we just, you know, sort of improvised and uh, figured out a way to, to make a form really quickly, like in half an hour, and then vacuum form in another half an hour, and then put in the laser cutter and trim it, right? So that was interesting. And so this is still very much a work in progress. There are a lot of details, but I just wanted to show it as something uh, interesting in that we're engaging sort of the K through 12 folks um, with using parametric modeling. Who would ever have thought that? Okay, I'm just going to skip through this and uh, end this as well. Looks like I have about a minute or two left. Yeah. Okay, now let's talk about the uh, last thing here, and that's um, something that we've turned to Smart Scrap, um, funded by the Graham uh, Foundation. And uh, basically, we're looking at uh, the Indiana limestone industry. There's a shot at one of our industry partners down in uh, Spencer, Indiana. This is like the field outside of their production facility with all their waste stone. I mean, this industry has a tremendous problem with generating a lot of waste. I mean, just stuff they don't know what to do with. But they want to, to 
figure out some way to reuse this stuff. It looks like an old graveyard of stone. It really is. So what we're proposing is that we develop um, some sort of system for designers to actually be able to see what's available as far as scrap or to design things and then be able to query a database of existing limestone scrap. That also involves being able to scan or capture that scrap information, the geometry, and create some sort of uh, database catalog for it. Okay, so if you think about the way they do these things, they, they take, bring in a big block, they slice it like a loaf of bread, and they slice it in different uh, directions depending on what they need, right, what they're going to ship to a fabricator. We propose by adding one extra shot um, to make these sort of standard two by two by variable length um, uh, tubes of stone that could be actually deployed in some sort of uh, 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 relief uh, pattern. And so we actually worked out a script where we could bring in a bitmap image that's black grayscale, use that to begin to determine this sort of relief pattern three-dimensionally, use that into a spreadsheet. Here's the spreadsheet color coded just so you can sort of see what we're talking about with these sort of variable heights, right? And then we're actually going to try to uh, make one of these as a proof of concept uh, here in a bit. You can sort of see some of these proposed generic applications of this with walls and, and floors and so on and so forth. So now we're actually thinking about beyond that just that one dimension into two dimensions and thinking about these sort of um, typical uh, uh, sort of offcuts um, and figuring out different patterns that we can, we can use uh, or make with these things, right? And trying to think through it, it's just as difficult as it sounds to make a, uh, a design script for a designer and then try to anticipate in, in the future you know, what, what that would entail. And so you can begin to see some of the patterns that we're, we're sort of reverse engineering um, on that, that end. We're coming up with patterns and then figuring out how we can query a database at the same time, we're trying to figure out a way to actually capture the geometry of the stone, make that database, um, and then how to organize the actual stone pieces so they can be um, put on a, a pallet and, and forklifted into the, the facility um, to be used. And then just last, this won't take long, maybe. I don't know, everything else has. But I just wanted to show you basically a wiki site that I've started. Um, so if you're interested in the sort of uh, um, scripting parametric design. There's a wiki site with a lot of information. There are actually libraries set up, um, similar to what Steve talked about, identifying patterns um, regarding computational design and so on and so forth. And then also a sort of library of all these sort of different things uh, that are pops up here. Yeah. So, you know, you'll see here that there's something like uh, generate spiral using parametric equations. So if you have a piece of geometry, you need a script, and you sort of know a parametric equation, you know, circle is pretty easy. Uh, where is it? Right, using sines and cosines. All you need to do is basically plug in a, a radius, right? This is pretty handy, you know, you can bring in Excel spreadsheet information. That's actually surprisingly handy, you know, if you're doing, uh, think of uh, daylight distribution, right? And so you get these samples points where you begin to get values, and you can bring those in as an Excel spreadsheet and begin to sort of make differentiated uh, components that uh, react directly to those values. Right? So I just wanted to uh, un unveil this, this wiki site with a sort of Rhino scripting library um, with various recipes right, that you could um, build on, you can add to, um, so on and so forth. So I apologize for the technical difficulties, and uh, hopefully you aren't all asleep. Thank you, Josh. Uh, we have a couple of minutes for some questions, if uh, people have questions before the break. Okay. Okay, thank you.